Hey everyone, what's up and welcome back to the garden. First and foremost in this video, I do want to apologize for this audio. Having major issues here. I actually broke my microphone. I just dropped it in the middle of my kitchen floor and it shattered into like a thousand pieces. So I guess I have to add that to the list of things that I need to buy. But um, I did want to go ahead and make this video no matter what because I needed to get this information out to you guys because it's fall here in my growing zone. So it's time to start thinking about, you know, what am I growing? What am I going to grow through the winter? What hardy annuals am I going to plant in the cut flower garden? Just lots of stuff to think about. So I wanted to make this video to kind of be kind of a guide for people who are growing hardy annual flowers for the first time ever because the concept can be a little bit confusing. I think especially if you are a beginner gardener that has very little experience with growing through the fall and the winter, um, this is something that might be helpful, I hope. So basically you might just, you know, what is a hardy annual? I've seen this term before in seed catalogs and generally, um, you know, when I was first learning to grow, I just kind of ignored it, like whatever, what's that mean? So basically, um, I like to think about it in kind of a simple way there are types of flowers that do really well in warm weathers like zinnias and sunflowers and amaranth and things like that but there are also types of flowers that do really well in cool weather now um, if you live somewhere like i do i am in kentucky i'm in zone 6b7 depending upon the year um, but if you live somewhere like i do your summers get really hot really fast sometimes there's not even really spring weather you know it just warms up real fast and the winters are pretty cold I mean, obviously down to about zero Fahrenheit is usually about the coldest we get here in my yard. Um, it can be difficult to try to understand how to grow these cool season flowers. Um, for example, Bachelor's Buttons, a classic cool season flower that does really well. Most seed packets will tell you to plant them as soon as the soil can be worked. Well, that's great. Um, and they will bloom. For example, if I, you know, direct sow Bachelor's Buttons in March, as soon as my soil can be worked, those will grow and they will produce a plant, but the problem is that plant is going to be, you know, very short usually and uh, we'll get good blooms, but the bloom season will also be just very quick, very short, not really very much time for cut flowers, um, but the thing is bachelor's buttons have a cold tolerance and that's really what hardy annual flowers is about, is about using these flowers that have some tolerance to cold to our advantage in the garden. So uh, over the course of time, you know, trial and error, I found that bachelor's buttons can easily overwinter in my yard without any kind of protection from a fall sowing. And what happens is, um, you know, I plant them in the fall, they overwinter dormant in the winter, and when the spring finally does arrive, I get these strong, healthy, robust bachelor's button plants that are, you know, three and a half and four foot tall and just produce massive amounts of blooms. These plants are branched, they're healthy and vibrant. Um, the difference is just night and day as to the quality of the plants that I am able to produce through the fall sowing. So in learning about hardy annuals, um, we really just wanna focus on the cold tolerance of each plant and see whether or not they are compatible with our own growing zone. As I mentioned, the growth cycle is gonna look a little bit different. Um, some people sow seeds in the fall and those seeds don't germinate till the next spring. That is, you know, that also works. It just depends on the type of seed. But um, in this video, the main thing that I'm really wanting to talk about is we are sowing our seeds or transplanting small plants, seedlings, and those seedlings are gonna overwinter, okay? Um, we'll get a little bit into protection later, uh, how to keep them nice and healthy, but they're going to overwinter, start to grow in the spring, and produce beautiful flowers. Uh, this is one of the reasons why knowing your own growing zone is so incredibly important. For example, here in my zone, I'll use the bulb ranunculus. We just had a video on it. Like I said, I'm in zone 6B7, so I need to protect those or I'm going to lose those throughout the season. The same is also true with plants that are started from seed. So um, my bachelor's button example, um, you know, they handle the cold here fine. But if I was somewhere further north or with a colder winter, I might have to protect them to keep them, you know, from being damaged or from being lost. There's lots of factors that play into this, which we'll get into a little later. But the whole process really is trial and error and trying different seeds and different plants and finding what works for you. 
um, in your garden because everybody's garden is different. You know, even if I went to my neighbor's garden, which none of my neighbors have gardens. Who are we kidding here? Um, <laughs> but if they had a garden, even their garden would be different than mine. As I mentioned, there are going to be tons of different ways that you can protect seedlings. On a small scale, I've seen people use um, like milk jugs cut in half as many greenhouses in a small flower bed. Also, you have low tunnels. When you construct low tunnels, you can just get a hoop bender. Um, I bought mine from Johnny Seeds. You can get a hoop bender. You can use Agrabon row cover frost blankets of varying thicknesses, or you can use mini greenhouses. Um, here in my yard, I have the large greenhouse that I've already showed you guys that you've seen um, that I overwinter most of my hardy annual flowers in. Um, this is another just thing. There's a lot of options. You kind of have to weigh what's right for you. A cold frame can also work if you have a cold frame. Just using just a regular old cheap cold frame or homemade cold frame. Um, there's lots of options. I know a lot of these techniques can also be a little bit costly, especially, you know, if you're just looking to grow some pretty flowers. So hopefully this video will be helpful in that. Also, it will be important to keep in mind that it can vary. Hardiness can vary depending upon the conditions. Like I said, my yard will get down to about zero Fahrenheit. But the thing is, we hardly ever get any snowfall. So if you live somewhere further north or colder than I am, but you get a lot of snowfall, you might have better success, better luck um, with leaving things uncovered because that snow can protect things. I know it sounds like a lot to keep track of, and the first season, usually, I find that I'm always surprised by things. Using our bachelor button example, um, you know, even though I don't have to do anything to protect those, sometimes during the coldest part of winter, I'll go outside and I'll look at the bachelor's button plants, and they look rough. They'll look brown and wilted, and I'll just think to myself, there is no way that these are going to make it. Uh, but usually, they always do. So in the process of learning to do all this and learning the ins and outs of uh, just fall planting and growing hardy annuals. I just don't think you should get discouraged because, uh, you know, once you figure out what does work, it's going to be awesome. As we do this video, as always, if you have any questions, be sure to leave them down in the comments because I am trying to, you know, do the best that I can to offer as much information as possible to help with this. But I don't have specific answers for specific growing zones. I really do try to you know, explain things as well as I can so that beginners and everybody can kind of get a better grasp on it because hardy annuals and fall flowers can really change the landscape of a garden, uh, especially, like I said, if you live in a zone like I do that's kind of confusing on when to plant, uh, it can really, you know, just create something absolutely gorgeous in the spring once spring finally does arrive. So be sure to leave any questions you have down below and I'll do my best to answer them. But, you know, sometimes I just don't, I just don't know the answers. So getting into which plants that I'm going to grow and what will grow, I should mention that some of these are hardy annuals, but I've also included some biennials in this list. And I know a lot of people even start perennials in this way, start the perennials in the fall that way they've had kind of a long time to establish and kind of get going before the next spring season arrives. Um, here in my zone, I generally plant my fall planted flowers um, the last week of September. That's about two to three weeks before my first frost date. Okay, and when I do plant these plants, um, you can either direct sow them. Direct sowing is always an option. Uh, lots of seeds are good candidates for direct sowing, such as scabiosa or bachelor's buttons. Lots of good options. Um, in general, I usually direct sow seeds that are on the larger side, but some other plants like chamomile, for example, and larkspur, I also direct sow those just because, um, you know, the seeds are teeny tiny and hard to handle. Uh, but other things like snapdragons or stalks or um, even Icelandic poppies, I always make sure to sow those in seed trays and then transplant once, you know, they've germinated, once we've got several sets of true leaves, and just transplant those in the location that I want them to be in. Usually any seed packet that has very few number of seeds, I'm going to start in seed trays. Whenever I start in seed trays, this is very much like what I do in the springtime. I just take my seed tray, I fill it with potting soil, um, again, it can be any seed tray you want. I just like to use these open ones. 
I fill it with potting soil and then what I'm going to do is I am going to set these trays outside. You know, they receive plenty of sun throughout the day. I'm going to be monitoring these seed trays and making sure that they are maintaining consistent moisture, just ideal germination requirements. Some of these seeds, I should also mention, will require cold stratification before they are planted. I do my best to mention that um, whenever I make these growing videos. But usually in order to accomplish that, all that I do is I just, you know, put the seed packets in a corner of my fridge for about a week or two weeks before planting cold treatment for the seeds to begin germinating. Uh, that's something else to can keep in mind. Anyway, um, I just put these seed trays outside, make sure the conditions are right, make sure they're getting water, make sure I'm paying attention to them. And usually germination starts to take place, you know, pretty quickly, usually within about a week. And I think this really is beneficial and helpful to me personally, because like I said, I don't have room indoors. I don't have grow lights. Uh, we're doing this on a budget, as strict to our budget as possible. You might want to put some uh, row cover over it or something if you're worried about, you know, birds or bugs specifically, like cabbage moths and things getting in there. Also, you want to make sure you're not laying them directly on the ground because that can lead to a lot of trouble with slugs and things. Uh, so, you know, as long as you're just paying attention to what's going on, keeping a few simple kind of potential problems in mind, uh, I'm usually pretty successful with starting my seeds in this manner. So, enough rambling. Let's get on to some of the things I'm planting this year. First up, we've already mentioned I am planting bachelor's buttons. Uh, as far as I know, this one does not require any kind of, you know, stratification. This one can also be direct sowed or um, transplanted from a tray. These are very, very robust. These are one of the first flowers that I ever had success with in terms of, you know, planting in the fall. These plants are going to be gorgeous. Uh, this year we're growing the classic romantic mix. Again, it's just very lovely tones of pink. I'm really looking forward to these and excited to see the blooms. Um, I won't be covering these or protecting these in any way. I kind of just always plant my bachelor's buttons out and hope that they fend for themselves. And if they don't make it, um, I know I'm going to have plenty of volunteers from this year that will make it because they do self-sow so readily. Next, we have Bells of Ireland. I think most people technically consider this one to be a biennial flower. Um, I kind of just grow it through the winter here. Um, to get that kind of biennial feel. So by planting this one in the fall, um, it's able to establish itself and then, you know, overwinter in my yard. And by the time the spring finally does come around, the plants are nice and big and lush and robust, hopefully. And uh, we'll have lots of success with that. Last year in the hoop house, I had a lot of problems with mold and Bells of Ireland was one of the plants that I did lose to mold. So um, this year, I am not putting the Bells of Ireland in a hoop house as kind of a test to see what happens, what the flowers are going to look like. I think it should be interesting. Unfortunately, I don't have all the answers in terms of that. Next up, we have Carnation and Dianthus. I kind of put these in the same group together. Obviously, depending upon where you are, Carnations can behave as perennials, some of them. And Dianthus, Sweet William Dianthus is a um, biennial. I couldn't think of the word. It's a biennial flower, but I kind of grow them both in the same way. I overwinter the carnations to get blooms the first year. Hopefully we'll have a video on carnations next year. I haven't made a video for that one yet, but I allow the sweet William to become established throughout the fall and the winter, and then in the spring the growth will resume and by about early summer to midsummer, we'll have those beautiful dianthus blooms that we can look forward to. Uh, I just love dianthus. I haven't grown it for a couple years. It's another one that self sows very, very readily. And um, I do not have to put this one in the hoop house either. So a lot of these biennial flowers are really good to start with because they often don't require additional protection, again, depending upon your growing zone. Next, we have Forget-Me-Nots. These are the Cineglossum amabile, or however you say that. Um, there are several types of Forget-Me-Nots, so it's always important to know which is which and what you're actually growing. These are the ones that are nice and tall. Um, also want to make sure that you're paying attention to invasive species list where you are. Some of them are invasive uh, or even considered noxious weeds, uh, so always check that out. 
do your own research and be responsible for the decisions that you make but these are gorgeous these cute little blue blooms I grew these in the hoop house last year, but my gut instinct tells me that they don't need my protection here in my zone. So this year I'm going to move them outside the hoop house because um, they showed no signs of damage throughout my winter. I know that this information about my winter doesn't really help you unless you're in my specific zone. But hopefully the listing these plants does give you some options in terms of you know what you can grow or what you could potentially grow. Next, I wanted to discuss poppies. There are obviously tons of different types of poppies. So before you plant, you're going to have to carefully uh, research whatever species and type and you know that you're growing. This year, I am growing both Shirley poppies and Icelandic poppies. Both of these poppies have showed to overwinter in my yard without protection from me. In general, I find that most poppies are very tolerant to cold and you know cold hardy. If there is a very cold night projected in my forecast, I do protect my Icelandic poppies just because, you know, uh, the seeds can be very expensive for these depending upon where you get them. And I want to make sure to take good care of plants that, you know, I have a little bit of an investment in. Uh, but overall, they seem to do really well. These will bloom in the spring. Uh, this year, we're growing Amazing Gray Poppy as well as the Champagne Bubbles Icelandic Poppy. Wallflower are another biennial plant um, that I've had success with from fall planting. Um, you can direct sow these as well as start these in seed trays. I've had success both ways before. Uh, this season, we're growing a Fair Lady mix, which is a mix of colors in the, you know, kind of oranges and reds and things like that. Uh, one of the things I really, really love about wallflowers is that they are insanely fragrant. The flowers themselves, are, I don't really think they're that much to look at. They're pretty and nice. Uh, but wow, the fragrance is just absolutely beautiful, um, at least off the orange types. I've never grown this mixed color type before, so I'm really eager to see that. Again, since this is a biennial, it does not have any trouble overwintering where I am at all with the help of me. So um, I would likely research that and check out the growing zones for that one if you're interested. I should also mention at this time, I have a lot of videos. I have almost a how to grow video for almost everything on this list. I'm only missing a few. So I'll put those hopefully on the video that you can check out if there's one that you are especially interested in. A lot of them are old, so you'll have to forgive the quality. Hopefully in the future as I continue to grow, I'll be able to update them. Next up, we have Larkspur. Uh, Larkspur is another one of my favorites. I should also mention that it's, it's toxic, so be sure to you know research before you grow this stuff, make sure you're keeping your kids and pets safe and everything. Um, these are gorgeous. They do not like to be disturbed. So I always direct sow the larkspur seeds. This is a seed packet that needs cold stratification first. I always put the seed pack in the fridge for about a week to two weeks before I sow them. It should also be noted that germination takes a long time with these. And once they do germinate, they're really small and you might not even see them. You might think they're weeds. I've done that before. Uh, so basically what I do with my larkspur is I direct sow the seeds into a well-worked bed. And then I just kind of forget about them and I cross my fingers and I hope that they show up. Usually by winter time, they've got their first true leaves and you can kind of see that they're kind of ferny looking. You know they're there. I wish I had more tips for germinating larkspur. Like I said, all of these hardy annuals like to germinate when the conditions are cool. Uh, with the exception of Bells of Ireland, which maybe better germinates when it's a little bit warmer. So you might want to start those a little bit sooner. But most of these prefer cool conditions. Chamomile is another one that I've grown in the past. I'm not growing it again this year simply because once you grow chamomile, it's likely that you will have it forever, especially if you let it go to seed. So um, you might want to think about controlling your chamomile. It is insanely easy to grow and it is insanely cold tolerant. Um, I direct sowed it maybe three years ago and I still have it. Um, the seeds are tiny like dust. 
Um, that's the reason I always direct sow it if I do grow it. They will multiply and spread across your garden. Just keep that in mind. Here in my yard, I don't have to protect them at all, and they just do their thing. So if you are a lover of chamomile, and there's no regulations around it where you live, definitely chamomile is a good option. But I should mention that chamomile doesn't really make great cut flowers. I tried to use it for cut flowers a few times, and there's a lot of problems with wilting. So if you are looking for cut flowers... Uh, I wouldn't go with chamomile. Next up, we have some salvia. I'm obviously talking about the salvia for cut flowers. I know I've seen it under different names, salvia, hornamum, or something like that. It's mainly the blue Sunday or blue Monday, pink Sunday, whatever they are, whatever cultivars they are. And these are really great uh, to grow in the fall. They do really well. They do require some protection from me here in my zone six garden. So I always put these in the hoop house and kind of protect them with row covers, additional row covers inside the hoop house during the coldest parts of the year. But the thing to remember with salvia, as we are starting it in a tray, I do suggest starting it in a tray, is that we need to keep the seeds consistently moist or they will not germinate, okay? These seeds, when they start to grow, when they start to germinate, they co they're covered with this like slimy mucilage goo on the seed coat. You need to make sure while those are germinating that that mucilaginous goo or whatever it is, I don't know what it is, honestly, uh, you need to make sure that that stays moist. I find that if you see the goo and then the tray dries out and it hasn't germinated yet, you're not going to get germination. I'm sure that has something to do with breaking down the seed coat or something. Honestly, I don't know, unfortunately. I think it's a great option to overwinter, especially if maybe you live in a place that has um, winters that are maybe a little bit warmer than mine. In this video, I also wanted to include English Daisy just because I had success with this in the past. It's technically a perennial, I believe, to zone four. Don't quote me on that. Uh, so it's a very robust plant. You know, I had mine in the hoop house. I didn't need to have it in the hoop house. It's not that great for cut flowers, but it ended up looking super cute in um, my potted arrangements, in my potted plants. And they bloom so incredibly early. These were blooming, one of the first things to bloom in February before everything else, even before my pansies. So I think that's worth mentioning. Speaking of pansies, these are another ones that will overwinter. Um, I've had these overwinter without any kind of protection. Usually I like to just stick them, you know, under a row cover or something just to make sure they make it because I do love pansies so much. Uh, I have a tutorial for how to germinate pansy seeds the best way. They seem like they germinate best with a little bit of darkness. So I'll put the card for that right here so you can click on it if you're interested. Um, but again, pansies and violas, another just I would consider an essential spring flower. And, you know, it's great to get a start on the pansies and to start them from seed. It's a great way to save money. There's so many varieties. You know, of course, you can go to the home improvement store and just buy some. Um, but why not just pick what kinds you want to grow and grow them yourself? It's awesome. Next, we have snapdragons. Snapdragons are one of my absolute favorite flowers. And I struggled with them for so, so long. Because, you know, I'd plant them in the spring and they would never get taller than like 8 inches. For me, overwintering snapdragons has been just a total game changer for my cut flower garden. I am able to harvest these big, beautiful snapdragons. And again, I have another video for this and uh, with more details about cold tolerance and how I protect them and everything in it. I'll just put a link to so you guys don't have to hear me rambling on and on about how much I love snapdragons. Scented stalks are another one. Scented stalks are really, really tough here in my garden. And by tough, I mean tough to grow. I have not successfully grown scented stalks yet. I'm not going to lie to you guys. I overwintered them in the hoop house. We had frost damage. We had mold. We had every single problem imaginable. Okay? Best news is the seeds are easy to germinate if you do want to try it. So that's good at least. Um, at least we know that. That's good. I'm going to try again. Hopefully we'll be successful. Straw flowers are another one. I have overwintered straw flowers in the hoop house before. They seem to be a little bit more sensitive to cold than some of the other things that I grow here. 
even when I grew them in the hoop house and covered them with a frost blanket, I did have losses. So I don't, I don't really recommend straw flowers as a fall planted flower unless you live somewhere warmer, which I think it might be a great option if you live somewhere warmer. Also, the blooms themselves, they're not really that big time like showy, um, you know, lots and lots of flowers to harvest. I don't really personally think that they're worth the space in the hoop house if I wanted to overwinter them. The good news is though, here in my zone, if I plant straw flowers in the spring, as soon as my soil can be worked, they will still produce tall, beautiful, gorgeous plants. So if this is not an option in the fall for you, straw flowers, definitely try it in the spring, might be worth it. On that same note, status is the same, same thing for me. Um, I can overwinter status here in my yard if I try really, really hard. For some reason, they just don't like the conditions. Um, but it does so well from a spring planting, you know, either way it goes, I'm not going to be upset. Moving on, we have some agrostemma. Agrostemma is kind of hit or miss in my yard, um, in terms of overwintering it without protection, but I can definitely grow it in the hoop house with no problem. Another one that is considered invasive or as a weed in many regions, so you definitely want to check that out before you grow it. Um, just making sure that nothing's going to get out of control. I find that people near me don't really like these flowers and cut flower arrangements for whatever reason. I think they're a very beautiful purple. And when I plant them in a nice little row, the way they sway in the breeze, I think is gorgeous. Um, you can direct sow these or you can start these in a tray. I've had success both ways. Um, I usually never plant these in the spring. I always plant these in the fall if I'm going to grow these. Uh, next, we have Lazy Anthus. This one is very complicated. Um, you know, it's taken me years to figure out how to grow this Lazy Anthus well, and I have a video for it, so I'll put the link to the video there too on the screen so you can click that if you're interested. Um, the main, the most time consuming thing about Lazy Anthus is starting the seed and patiently waiting for them to bloom. I'm trying to grow Lysianthus from seed this year. Hopefully we'll have success. You know, honestly, your guess is as good as mine. Um, this is going to be a true test of my gardening skills, hopefully. Next, we have wheat. In this video, I'm referring to winter wheat. Obviously, there are tons of cold-tolerant wheats. Usually, you know, pretty much wherever you are, I think you can probably overwinter wheat. As always, wheat is just a simple, you know, filler plant that can look beautiful either when it's green or when it's dried. Very versatile and a very cool way to make use of just little spaces that maybe you don't put plants in. Just throw some wheat seeds down. I have wheat just scattered throughout my yard in random places sometimes. Next is one of my other favorites. It's feverfew. I know this is technically a perennial, but I basically treat it as an annual every growing season just because it blooms so fast. These are extremely cold tolerant. They don't need help of a hoop house. And like I said, I have a video for this one as well if you're interested. So easy to germinate. I do put these for cold stratification, put the seeds in the fridge for about a week just to make sure they're going to germinate really well for me. Um, you can direct sow these and you can start them in a tray. They transplant very easily. No transplant shock or anything like that. Uh, very versatile. If you're looking for a first time filler or cut flower foliage to grow as a beginner, I think this is definitely a good one. Uh, only drawback is some varieties can be a little bit stinky um, just because they're fever few. Uh, but overall, I think really good choice. Next we have... Gerbera daisies or Gerber daisies. I don't even know. I've heard that they're hardy to zone 8. I'm growing them for the first time, so you're learning as I'm learning here. Uh, also, attempting to grow lupines or lupins, however you say it, for the first time, as well as grow some additional hollyhock. These are both biennial plants that I have, you know, I've had so much trouble with these biennial plants, both of these, just because, uh, you know, the conditions just aren't ideal. There's always some kind of disease or pest to tend with here, it seems like. And I'll let you know more about those as soon as I learn about it, too. Bupleurum is another popular filler or foliage. Um, I do cold stratify these seeds before planting, and I plant them in trays. For whatever reason, the germination on my Bupleurum is always really spotty. However, if I let the plants go to seed 
and drop their seeds in my garden, I will have tons and tons of Buplerum. So I'm thinking maybe they like germination temperatures to be a little bit warmer, uh, but this definitely is one of those flowers that once you have it, you are likely to have it a lot. And uh, these have overwintered here in my yard in spaces that are not protected as well as in my hoop house. They get nice and tall and we can just get arm loads of filler. So that might be an option for people looking for filler. We also have Nigella or Love in a Mist. This is another one that I've grown here in the hoop house and used a little bit of row cover for protection. I have grown these without any kind of protection before and lost about half the plants. So um, I think I'm really kind of right on the line between the cold tolerance for Love in a Mist and um, I think they will make it in a lot of places with just, you know, minimal frost blankets and things like that. So, of course, if you live somewhere a little bit warmer, it might be another really good option. I know a lot of people really love the seed pods of these because they are just so unique and interesting looking. But I, I personally, I just really like the flowers. I think the flowers are really cool. Uh, rounding out this list, we have kale, ornamental kale. Um, it just kind of varies depending upon the kale as to cold hardiness. I usually put mine in the hoop house. We also have Atroplex hortensis or auroch. Auroch seems to be um, a little bit problematic where I am in terms of overwintering from a fall planting, at least outdoors. So I always wait until um, spring to plant the auroch. The same is also true with cress. Uh, I know these are great fillers and foliages, and the good news is they have a really quick turnaround if you do have to make a spring planting, which I do, um, but, you know, somewhere else might be different, so I needed to mention it on this list. Also, cilantro, very, very cold tolerant. Um, not traditionally a cut flower, but I do like to use the seed pods in arrangements because I just think they're really pretty. Anyway, and last but certainly not least for this, I wanted to mention annual phlox. Annual phlox can be a little bit tricky. I do have to grow it in the hoop house. Um, but the stems, they come up. They're beautiful. They're gorgeous. Uh, they're very, very nice. And when I plant them from a fall planting, or excuse me, and when I plant them from a spring planting, they just don't get, you know, quite as big. They're kind of straggly. And I think the extra time in the, the fall and the winter, it really, really helps in terms of flower development and becoming established and giving me some really beautiful blooms early in the season. That's really about it for this video. I truly hope that it was helpful. A lot of the times I feel like I was just rambling on and on and on and hopefully the audio isn't too bad on this one. I am so sorry for that again. Order another one as soon as I get my paycheck. I'm gonna order another microphone and we'll get things back to the way they were. So thank you so much for your patience and your understanding. As always, if you're new to the channel and you enjoy this video, be sure to subscribe. I would absolutely love to have you. We're always making new content about growing cut flowers and growing vegetables and who knows, maybe some DIY projects. So if you like a little bit of surprise, there's really no telling what I might post next. As always, be sure to hit like and share with a friend, try to get our engagement up and leave a comment. Tell me, have you ever grown any of these hardy annuals before? I always love to hear from you guys and learn from your past experiences and things like that. That's really about it. I hope that you are having such an incredible day and I'll talk to y'all later. Bye guys.